Welcome to this episode of Behind the Art, where I will invite the most interesting and talented artists from the 3D and visual effects space and more. Together, we will take a look behind the scenes and dive into their workflows, tips and tricks and their take on different topics. For every episode, there will also be a live Q&A session in the end for my exclusive community on Discord. This is so I can support these free YouTube videos and interviews, but also if you want to progress faster in 3D, get personal feedback and yes, yeah, start freelancing and get some help, make sure to check it out with the link in the description. For those who don't know, I'm Florin and I've been doing 3D for over four years now and I've worked with big clients like Marshmallow, Medicine Beer and more and also built a big following on Instagram. With that out of the way, let's get started with the interview. On today's episode, I invited Niche Novos. He creates stunning science fiction 3D animations, which allowed him to grow over 90k followers on Instagram. I'm so glad that you're here and thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's good. It's, uh, it's a really good thing to have a conversation uh, as an artist and also as a part yes. of this community, which is growing you know, every day, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm really interested to get some behind the scenes look into your You're workflows coming. and your thoughts on the whole topic. And yes, I would say, let's begin with your introduction. Um, yes, just yeah. introduce yourself yeah. and sure, yeah, sure. tell about your journey. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is uh, Nishad and I am Nish Novus. Uh, I'm an architect, artist and a designer. And I've been uh, working as an art director, a CJ artist, a 3D artist, uh, for quite a while now, and I love doing crazy stuff. And uh, I've been practicing architecture and uh, have the CGI and animation business going on for well over a year and a half. And I used to be a visiting professor at the University of Architecture uh, for almost a year and a half. And I left uh, like last year to pursue my own, you know, work. And yeah, so I'm really excited to have the discussion today uh, and I'm assuming it will be more, you know, focusing on the whole idea of creation itself and also the technical aspects of the things we make and, you know, post on Instagram and have it as a commercial project as well. So, yeah, I've been I've been exploring this uh, 3D world for like well around uh, four to five years now, but I must say initially it was not all cool looking sci-fi stuff, to be honest. And, uh, you know, I started quite late that uh, entire city and sci-fi thing. It started quite late. And initially it was all, you know, uh, learning about modeling and designing uh, in general. And the softwares that I use were not uh, actually the softwares which are very popular uh, in the 3D community right now, which is, you know, Blender, uh, Cinema 4D, and those sort of things. I used Rhino, Rhino 5, which is a really good modeling software, but, uh, you know, I found out about Blender during the COVID lockdown. So that was, mm. you know, the best break that we had, all of yes. us had, and a lot of people found out about, about uh, Blender uh, at that time, because a lot of reels were getting popular and stuff. So, yeah, that time I found out about it. Yeah. Nice. So Me? right now you're like quite okay. bit on quite big on Instagram with over yeah. 90k followers. Um yeah, do you quickly like wanna yeah, tell us your journey, like how you grew there, yeah. how you were able like since COVID, like why like what was the reason why you started posting on Instagram? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. just how it so has the been. entire entire 3D journey started uh it before that, it was all about 2D art for me. I have mm -hmm. uh, studied architecture and been trained as an architect. And as a part of the, the academics in architecture, you are supposed to learn any basic 2D uh, graphic software, as in Photoshop or Corel Draw, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And also some 3D modeling softwares, as in uh, SketchUp, 3ds Max, and in some rare cases, Rhino, like me. Uh, but to be honest, the required knowledge for the architecture work is like, you know, just scratching the surface of the actual potential that the software can do. And also, which is fair, because uh, that is the only required amount to make, uh, you know, visualizations or uh, academic level, commercial level work. But uh, you can also learn any rendering software, but it is not that compulsory to have it in your back pocket at all times. 
but in my case, uh, I was always extremely interested in art and expressing my own thoughts through a visual medium at all times. Um, in the beginning, my passion was actually sketching and painting. I also loved uh, mm. learning about art history, architectural history, and you know a lot about tectonics, uh, form building, and uh, making physical stuff in general. But uh, you know, because of that need to express the artistic ability uh, and the ideas that I always had, the biggest goal in the early years, like when I was sixteen to eighteen years old. it was to learn as many mediums of expression as possible mm. uh, so in my second year of college uh, in my it was around uh, 2018 i found photoshop and that basically opened a whole new portal to this insane world of visual art around the time i got obsessed uh, with the idea of learning more and more every single day you know parallel to that i got exp- exposed to rhino as well and that basically made me fall in love with 3d modeling and rendering basics nice. so i remember i used to wake up at 3 3:30 in the morning and get ready and you know spend like 16 15 16 hours every day before i you know passed out at night just watching tutorials making stuff here and there it was mm-hmm. a crazy process of you know trial and error just kept going for almost 2 years and during lockdown one fine day i found out about blender and you know the rest is history <laughs> because uh, because that was that was this exposure that you know um, i found about it uh, through beeple which was not about blender but uh, the the exploration or the exposure was uh, more towards you know making stuff in 3d that you can make basically movie level visuals mm-hmm. can simulate reality uh, in a software which is you know which can be done on a laptop or a computer at that time So you know the first exposure uh, came from watching few people artworks and also the best thing possible for a beginner which is the blender guru donut tutorial you know that made me extremely yeah. interested in the software in general it's like it's like going to the gym you know you have to pick up the lightest uh, dumbbell first and then mm-hmm. you know pro- progress your way uh, through it so it was always uh, first one was you know blender gurus uh, donut tutorial at that time it was i think uh, blender 2.3 or 3. 3.1 i think blender 3 or 3.1 came out and it had okay. this entire uh, rebranding sort of a thing going on at that time the mm. the controls changed yeah. and a lot of big deals changed at that time so yeah you know that made me extremely interested in the software in general and also ensure that i can at least make something here in this in alien software you know which nobody around me was talking about you know nobody knew about it uh, around me at least and the insane thing uh, was that you know you can basically make really uh, you can basically uh, simulate reality in a very methodic way you know like breaking down every small things uh, that you find out around you or maybe you might have imagined that there all you need is basically a very deep knowledge of the workflow and insane imagination that can basically ensure that you can create your own stuff yeah so that idea basically fascinates me the most the the social media mm-hmm. aspect really came late but before that it was all you know learning stuff and that was the longest part uh, of the entire journey so because the artworks that i i'm so sorry if i'm talking so much no no it's perfect <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the the because the artworks that i made these days are a product of years and years of evolution mm. and i went from making one point perspective portals with a guy standing in front of it with just mm, different you yeah. know colored backgrounds everyone does that you know some metal uh, floor with some reflection and some immersive material in front of it yeah that, that basically is the introduction to that i'm assuming that must be the same case for you as well but, yeah you know? yeah definitely <laughs> yeah it's just something yeah. that looks really good because you have like the reflective floor and everything and it looks cool with it's like some immersive material always looks cool some glow over it yeah uh, but yeah and what was like the initial like your motivation to post yeah. um i assume you created a new account for this yeah yeah i did 
So it's it's like a condensation of a lot of things that I was going through at the time mm-hmm. when I started Niche Novus uh, in 2022. Uh, I had another old uh, page before that that I you know just stopped uh, doing any progress on. So I just started this entire new persona. So earlier uh, and sometimes still there used to be a theme that was a sole idea behind Niche Novus that a person who has rediscovered himself creating mm-hmm. something for himself. Completely different persona is basically mm-hmm. on this visual journey. Uh, and that time being obsessed with people, I used to uh, post every single day. So the entire nice. <laughs> learning curve was uh, falling in love with uh, a new artist every now and then and trying to learn through, you know, studying their work, understanding their work, uh, you know, Again and again. So niche novus, the word novus itself means uh, rebirth in Latin. Mm. So the the word novus comes from that, and niche is my nickname. Uh, my yeah, name is that, Nishan. And, yeah. yeah, and the spelling <laughs> N I C H E that is an architectural element, which is like a depression in the wall. So in my classroom, there mm. was this small niche in the wall where I had just, uh, you know, pushed my table in there. And that's where I started learning about digital art. Mm, so that's nice. the place, like an homage to uh, the entire idea of niche novice. That's, that's how so this cool. all yeah. started. Yeah. <laughs> you pretty, have like pretty, an entire uh, story of... behind your name. Yeah, it's exactly. so cool. <laughs> it yeah. has a story behind it. Yeah. So, yeah, I started focusing more on the, you know, more on the posting side quite mm-hmm. uh, recently but before that it was all just uh, you know constantly making stuff uh, happen i usually have a timer on my side uh, and you know in that uh, you know limited time i just have to come up with something immediately nice. you know uh, but without really worrying about the reach impressions and the mm-hmm. post itself you know slowly as it started getting more yeah. attention i started focusing more on the business and marketing aspect of instagram mm-hmm. And what should I make that gets more motion online? So also to get more uh, work and gigs and professional opportunities mm-hmm. and make sure that I have something that supports my business as well. So yeah. never really liked following trends and doing the viral yeah. kind of yeah. reels, <laughs> but it really helps with the numbers. And, you know, surprisingly, I found that it also ensures your legibility as a non AI art creator. Uh, that's something that I've, yeah. I've found recently. You know, you have the viewport and then you have the post processing mm-hmm. and then the final product as a video yeah, or as an image yeah. rather than just the only thing that is, uh, you know, a video which is posted just, you know, out there. Yes, it's the, like proof, yeah. proof of work. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. That is like a proof. How, how do yeah. you balance these two things? Because I also come across these two things a lot. Like the, on one side, you have like, as an artist, you want to, create something um yeah that you like that you want to do and but still if you want to get like more views or want to promote your business um you also have to follow like some kind of um rules of instagram or some like yeah do videos that are favored by the algorithm so yeah yeah, like how do you balance these two things to yeah get like a satisfying outcome for yourself yeah, it's it's actually a very yeah it's actually a very you know long process of understanding your audience actually because uh, in my case uh, what I've noticed is that if I post something and if it is uh, getting some good uh, you know uh, good appreciation on social media in the first one or two hours that is like more than enough for me. Uh, for quite a mm-hmm. while, that was the whole case. But mm-hmm. you really have to find a balance uh, between, you know, making something for yourself as an artist and also making something uh, for uh, social media as well. It's it's like you are working for a robot who doesn't really like you, but has to get the job done. That is that is like yeah. making, <laughs> making art just for algorithm. Uh, I have to do that. I never really liked ruining my entire feed on Instagram. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it was always just very vivid artworks in the square format, but I never really liked doing the real backgrounds, you know, where you have a viewport image in the, in the, in your feed. But uh, after a point I had to make 
uh, that decision where uh, you know you have to just let that be and uh, post stuff because uh, getting a good reach is also very important uh, for me personally and for a mm-hmm. lot of people because that basically is yeah. a motivation for you definitely uh, yeah definitely because uh, you need something that is giving you enough motivation in terms of numbers in terms of uh, getting you good exposure to clients or maybe to other artists who might appreciate work, your work so that is very important so for me yeah. the, <laughs> the 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 changing point was finding out about this artist called Rui Wang uh, mm, who yeah. is yeah who, he is a chinese artist and uh, he does this insane crazy heavy uh, sci-fi visuals and mm. uh, once i found out about his work i again being obsessed with another artist i started learning more about his work i started buying his uh, you know uh, assets or the uh, project files and just spending hours just zooming in zooming out what has been done what has been done and that has been basically a whole new learning curve for me Mm-hmm. where uh, the focus is more on breaking down everything that is existing you know taking some things here and taking some things from here and then you know making everything juxtaposing stuff and coming up with a good composition so having good understanding of design basics also helps when yeah. you are making some art absolutely mm-hmm. because if the composition is not right no matter how detailed or how beautifully than the model is or even the texture is the outcome will never be that good if mm-hmm. it is not curated with so it is extremely important to have every principles related to design uh, in mind while making something and that's the whole social media journey actually it is you know learning personal excellence personal you know asset generation Uh, in terms of your mentality in terms of your workflow the entire thought process because when the learning curve is extremely steep you need to you know every day is day one so mm-hmm. every other day is day one for you you are learning something new every day from other artists from a lot of tutorials i've learned a lot from your tutorials as well i never knew how to you know uh, you work with a lot of elements at once i just saw Uh, a reel of yours and just found out about it so there are a lot of little things that you pick up from different places and that is basically a culmination of your entire work on workflow yeah that's that's yeah. that's what that's, i feel actually yeah. there's such a good um like mindset like every day is a new day and every day you like start from zero because yeah. with that like on every project you can learn something new and like i see like sometimes i get lazy and i tend to do the yeah. same stuff for a few <laughs> weeks um, because like, it just feels better if you, you can do the thing you already know but i think with this mindset you can get like out of your comfort zone yeah and yeah like you progress crazy sure. fast exactly yeah. exactly because yeah. to to progress you need to you know fail at some point you need to fail faster as well mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. if you fail that is basically but but at that time it is very important to tell yourself that you know you need to do something else for some time because as artists people really need some time to you know sit down do nothing because mm-hmm. we need to recharge our batteries our, our ram uh, the ram in our uh, head gets <laughs> uh, destroyed after a while so it gets heated up and you need some time to stop and you know look back look at something else because i'm not that good at uh, making characters and character animations but uh, if i am uh, you know feeling stuck uh, making some sort of sci-fi things again and again because i have a really bad habit of uh, reusing the old project files uh, if i if i made something which is looking cool i'm just going to find another camera angle and some you know color changes and maybe change some elements here and there and make something new from the existing thing which mm-hmm. after a point gets really boring so at that time you know maybe learn about sculpting maybe learn about mm-hmm. texturing some other things and uh, yeah geometry nodes it's always you you learn something new about geometry nodes in every single tutorial on youtube because <laughs> everyone uses blender in their own way and everyone mm-hmm. uses any software in their own way after a while because uh, the software should not really dictate what you are making 
because at that time it was going to become uh, very mundane and very basic but mm-hmm. the moment you start telling the software what you should be doing and what it should be making that is actually what expression as an artist means so that is the whole ball game here because uh, it's very tough to you know find some sweet spot where you can balance everything and it takes a really long time to find out that balance between these things mm-hmm. yeah yeah well said yeah yeah um yeah so you mentioned before i think quickly that you like set a timer for yourself to come up with an idea yeah um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this mm-hmm. like how you come up with idea like how you get inspiration because like your artworks mm-hmm. are really like Second i've never time. seen something like this before <laughs> they they have like their really unique style to it um, yeah well. so yeah i would yeah maybe so, you can tell a little bit more yeah. about this and the process is actually very fluid for uh for you know creating something as i mentioned before you need some time to sit down and do nothing and mm-hmm. in that time you are basically trying to distract your mind uh, from the thing that you are doing because you are not just uh, creating any 3d composition uh, one time after other you are actually creating something which has a concept which has a backdrop of this uh, you know idea so maybe you you should read a lot you should uh, you know practice a lot of little things here and there just to warm up and stuff but uh, what i do is basically i have 55 minutes uh, timer and uh, you know i take 5 minutes to get into the zone and then the timer starts mm. and uh, yeah so it's not 60 minutes it's 5 minutes before mm. 55 minutes to get into the zone and uh, once you start doing something you know put your phone aside maybe in the other room whatever you are into uh, just put every distraction around you away and just let your mind flow and just uh, let all the ideas flow you can read about some things you can watch a movie you can uh, actually navigate through a game any any good uh, you know rpg and uh, look at a lot of references a lot because uh, i am really uh, fascinated by this idea of uh, you know having a lot of things in front of you and uh, making something which is basically like a filtered version of your entire thought process mm-hmm. or your entire research visual research basically and uh, i think i saw this in a blender conference video i think blender guru uh, was andrew price he was saying mm-hmm. something he basically quoted someone where uh, you know if you are trying to copy or if you are trying to remake something in the language of one artist you are going to be the next that artist but if you steal from 100 different places you are the most authentic person in the world <laughs> so the most important thing is to have this very wide and very mm-hmm. large visual library that you can basically use whenever you are trying to make something so you know you might like lighting from somewhere you might like elements from somewhere you might like concepts from somewhere uh, some, any way of models that you like uh, you can download stuff and use it you know it's like a child playing with toys you know a lot of uh, things layer in front of you like lego bricks uh, the assembly is completely up to you so mm-hmm. you can use assets you can model stuff and everything uh, happens in that 55 minutes and after that 55 minutes you take another 5 to 10 minutes break and then start mm-hmm. another timer but in that uh, you know refrained time frame you are not supposed to do anything else you are not supposed to be distracted by anything else you know just mm-hmm. focus on the productivity and you know the outcome and also the process nice. itself because the process itself teaches you a lot i so if, when you talk about any rendering engine uh, i always was obsessed with cycles and there is this mentality to you know hate ev after a point <laughs> because uh, it is basically you know it doesn't really give you the the outcome that you envision mm-hmm. in the beginning but if you play around with it if you use the settings wisely uh, if you do the lighting correctly 
everything can be done some scenes are even better in ev and that's why in large scenes i prefer using ev and that was basically an accident i never really thought of using ev but what happened was uh, i was just you know changing my uh, render engine from cycles to workbench for the before and after uh, reel uh, for the for the first reel that i made and uh, i said let's try something and right at that time my computer crashed and by mistake i clicked on ev uh, and it it started lagging immediately so i said you know let's just wait for it to load and then mm-hmm. switch to the other render engine but you know it stopped for a second and i saw this very beautiful glow around the lights i saw this amazing interaction between light mm-hmm. and the surface and the reflectivity i also found some other artists uh, like ian hubert in some of his uh, scenes he uses ev uh, mm-hmm. i think uh, ruhi huan uses ev for almost all his artworks and then i you know started digging deeper into it that you know what kind of things that you can do because there are no render settings that you can do in ev not that precisely you can just change the glow and how the light interacts with the the surface but if you uh, orient the camera right and if you use the volumetrics right it is actually much better than cycles and much faster actually because yeah, in cycles uh, even in my computer which is like 4090 rtx 4090 graphic card it takes like uh, one minute to render one frame for the scenes that i make if it mm-hmm. is cycles but if if i'm doing using ev it is like 8 seconds or 6 seconds per frame so you know you can just tap and just go away and then come back yeah. and your entire video will be ready yeah so it's it's much better and you know these accidents teach you a lot and as i said mm-hmm. before you need to fail in order to learn something new and you also need to fail faster so you need to produce a lot of work and then learn from all the mistakes and you know come up with something immediately yeah. Yeah, so that was the whole productivity hack that i have it's not a hack mm. actually it's just a simple mindset that you mm. just need to sit down and make things happen nice. don't really worry about it being very good or the outcome being very good or being liked yeah. by people it will be appreciated by the right audience mm. we talk about a lot of uh, you know problem with uh, um, our attention span and a lot of uh, you know the time we spend on social media we are constantly swiping but if you have something which is actually good and people who are actually interested in it the attention span does not really matter because attention span is less for bad stuff <laughs> for the stuff which is not really providing you any intellectual clarity or any intellectual uh, understanding after a while if the stuff is good you are going to stop and watch it that is the whole logic behind this entire you know attention grabbing stuff so mm-hmm. it has been the philosophy for quite a while for me now yeah and that helps with procrastination a lot because i procrastinate a lot that <laughs> everyone does because yeah. uh, your mind gets saturated after a point and you need to stop somewhere mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah that's like so good what you just said um yeah yeah and also like when i first heard that you you that you're using ev for your scene i was like my mind was also a little bit blown <laughs> because i'm like i was exactly one of these people who i'm just always using cycles because i'm too yeah. lazy to figure out ev like at the beginning i used some ev for some motion graphic stuff yeah but for the like, ducky 3d cre- ducky 3d yeah. <laughs> yeah. but like of you course. create yeah you create crazy realistic scenes that are just stunning and yeah hearing no, that they're made with EV is so encouraging especially with the like updates they announced they're like adding to yeah. EV like the next gen EV um which will be crazy and yeah but also your whole process so like i just want to ask one more thing to this and then we can move on yeah. and also in a few minutes we can also take some more behind the scenes look where you can share our screen and actually show us how the scene looks in a blend file yeah. um but yeah so in this one hour do you like to get practical do you create like a mood board or you, do you sketch certain things up or like how do you bring everything like from your mind into this yeah into yeah. your artwork 
Yeah, so the sketching thing that you said, uh, that is basically the idea that I always have. The, mm -hmm. the sketching okay. uh, process actually helps a lot. Uh, you know, coming up with something. And I think I was seeing a watercolor tutorial on YouTube. I don't know why, but I was seeing it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the artist was basically creating small clip arts. And uh, clip art is basically, you know, something very zoomed out where you are just making this small frame mm -hmm. where you are just trying mm -hmm. to figure out some composition and drawing very tiny stuff, not too big. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, while thinking you need a very fluid medium. Uh, you either pick up something which is very, uh, something very thick to draw like a charcoal stick or a very thick pencil to, you know, keep your lines very fluid. Uh, or you shrink the canvas and think in a very small scale. So when you put it like, uh, you know, five feet or two feet away from you, how is it looking? If the composition is right, it will look good. But mm -hmm. if the composition is not right, you know, it will keep watching your eye. And uh, the sketching process really helps because uh, throughout my academic career, uh, I, you know, started learning or thinking through uh, pencil. So if you have an idea and if you have it in your head, it is necessary for you to put it on a paper and think through the pencil. So you just have to let your hand flow around and, uh, you know, come up with something which is looking good. And if something is looking really nice uh, for me visually uh, or uh, composition wise, I would start modeling it immediately. So, you know, it is like a switch. So if something is looking nice as a sketch, why not try it uh, in 3D? So the elements that I use in my recent artworks, you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, some sort of an umbrella. Mm -hmm. So the, the scene that I'll be breaking down and I'll, I'll also show the model that I made before that. But that basically came from this uh, digital artwork created by some artists. I saw that on Pinterest and, you know, that uh, form itself of that object really fascinated me. So I just started making some, you know, random shapes, you know, something like this, like a funnel or something. It can be, so uh, when you start with sketching, you don't really have to worry about the scale. It can be something which can be grabbed by your hand mm -hmm. or it can be something uh, which you imagine as a building or as a city as well, or as a civilization, like in a huge scale. So, you know, like, uh, let's say you have a globe like this in your hand. Mm. This is actually an emulation of the model of the entire planet itself. Mm. But right now it's just a toy, which is, you know, emulating whatever is happening. You know, there is some sort of a feel to it, some sort of a uh, proportion to it. And having a sense of proportion really helps proportions and scale. Uh, you know, once you start understanding the idea of scale, you can basically imagine anything at any level. So something, mm which can be uh, a furniture piece or a show piece. It can actually be thought uh, as, you know, something like a building or something like a huge uh, object floating in the sky. So you can imagine massive shapes around it, or you can imagine some little thing that is happening on your table. So sketching really helps with that. And as fluid the medium is, as uh, well, your mind will also follow your ideas and your hand starts following you after that. So if you think with pencil, I, you know, I, I still remember I make a lot of uh, tiny doodles and scribbles around all the time. I have papers next to me. I have pencils next to me. You know, you can use your iPad, you can use your uh, notebooks, whatever, or pen, mm -hmm. anything that you're comfortable with. Anything that makes you feel comfortable. You don't really have to put efforts in the thinking part. You just have to think of one after another. The 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 mm -hmm. important part is translating that thought or translating that uh, abstract idea into something visual. So if I say I'm, I'm happy with some tiny scribble that I made, but how well can I, uh, you know, model it? In 3D. Mm -hmm. If the shape is right, you a lot of artists block out their scenes, right? It is exact, mm -hmm. it is the same logic. 
So a lot of people block out the scenes, you know, trying to come up with some sort of composition. This is the same process, but it happens on paper, you know. So you start detailing uh, out the scene after a while and you start understanding a lot of things uh, while making. So, you know, it is a very interesting long process and it is not uh, something that happens, you know, just like that. It has to, you know, marinate and it has to simmer around for a while to, you know, be something very good. So that is my creation process. That is how I like to, you know, make stuff uh, around all the time. But yeah, also reusing your old project files is mm -hmm. also fine. You can you can just uh, move the camera around, just play, and you know use the the walk walk controls, the, the like gaming controls, like the fly through controls that you have in printed the WASD. You can just fly around in your scene and just find a better uh, camera view. Yeah. So that always uh, looks quite nice, you know. It's so inspiring <laughs> what you're saying, and also <laughs> like yeah, it's so interesting like how you do stuff differently and yeah, yeah it's yeah it's uh, it's never uh, so for me it was never like uh, mm -hmm. you know creating uh, pretty cool looking stuff one after the other it was always mm -hmm. this journey of learning new stuff because yeah. i cannot sit idle i'm extremely hyperactive and i need something mm -hmm. to do all the time so uh, these sort of things really help but once you are interested in something uh it starts evolving one after the other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's always good to have that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so, yes. Uh, one more thing that would be interesting to me is, um, I think if I'm right, you're doing 3D full time now, right? Uh, not just 3D. I'm actually doing two, two things at once. So mm -hmm. I also have my architecture practice. I design buildings ah, okay. and stuff. Yeah. I do interior designing, furniture designing. And uh, mm -hmm. also I do this 3D uh, stuff at the sides. But the more time is spent on the 3D work because I really like doing that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> for me, it's like you, you should be able to do three things uh, uh, as a career something mm -hmm. that you are trained for so something that you studied mm -hmm. something that brings you good enough money to sustain and mm -hmm. the third thing would be something that you are really passionate about something mm -hmm. that you do for yourself so that you don't get bored with everything else that you are doing <laughs> so <laughs> these three things like like a fragmentation is very important you know mm -hmm. so that is the whole philosophy that i have uh, for for uh, you know working but yeah i really enjoy uh doing this as a profession uh because uh it is insanely uh growing and it is growing mm -hmm. at a very rapid range mm -hmm. uh, and very rapid speed actually because uh, if you see uh before the like any dj uh, shows or anything that you see these days it is not just the music. It is an audiovisual experience. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I I am currently creating visuals for a lot of uh, DJs. I've been working with a lot of creatives uh, on that entire thing. But uh, that basically, you know, opened this whole new portal to this entire world that is not just focusing on, uh, you know, one aspect of art. It is basically playing with all six or five senses that a human has. You are seeing something, you are feeling something, uh, you are listening to a lot of things and that basically mm -hmm. creates an experience. So the art yeah. went, so even if you make 3D art, the output is always going to be 2D because you are seeing it on your phone screen or you are seeing it on your laptop's uh, screen. But uh, you know, once the experience uh, part gets into the picture, the entire thing, you know, gets up a notch. Uh, it's basically, you know, art on steroids. I mm -hmm. So a part of my thesis, uh, my, my final year thesis project was experience designing. It, uh, the technical term for that is scenography and uh, phenomenology, where you are basically translating a phenomena or a feeling or a scene into something physical. 
So it is basically creating a space, a physical space, an architectural space where the space itself can be sculptural, the space can be normal and the elements in it can be sculptural or you can also talk about the spaces in between, the transition, uh, transition uh, spaces. So that entire idea, uh, you know, translates to anything that we do now because the DJs are not just the DJs now. They are audiovisual performers. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you see Afterlife, uh, you can see Rebuke, who I'm working with now. Uh, there are a lot of other artists. So even the infrastructure uh, which is there for such shows like Tomorrowland, Coachella, Afterlife, the screens are so massive and the guy standing next to it is so small. The music is so loud. So the experience is emulated and everything is, uh, you know, uh, done at once, immediately. Mm -hmm. so that is that is one of the best things that we can see now. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, everything is evolving and you have to evolve uh, along with it very quickly. So yeah. yeah. But it's, it's so interesting for me to see how you're like, the thing you learned in school, like the architectural stuff, yeah. how it's like transfers over to 3D. Because for me, I learned or I come from like more of a IT, like from the IT space, which, um, yeah, definitely helped with um, the whole problem solving and everything. Um, but still, I imagine like from your part, like where you actually design um, yeah, buildings and so on. Um, and now in Blender, you're doing like similar things. How would you say, how useful is it, or like practically, how can you like transfer this knowledge into Blender? And like, how does it look practically, if you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Okay. So that's a very nice question, actually, because uh, um, if you think about it, it's not uh, just a translation of your thoughts into something. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, it's like a kid playing with toys and trying to come up with something. Sometimes mm -hmm. you are just, uh, you know, trying to play around, make something happen and just come up with something. <clears throat> But uh, for the things that I do now, I never knew that, uh, you know, learning about architecture would translate to something which is uh, mm. something that I'm doing right now. I never knew I would do this. But, mm. uh, you know, I saw Rui Wang, I saw a lot of uh, uh, Ian Hubert uh, workflow tutorials and stuff on his Patreon, his short films. <clears throat> and then I saw, you know, there is a link between everything. You can be a sculptor and move to 3D. You can be a painter and move to 3D. You can be an architect and move to 3D. You can be someone who is uh, basically into coding and then you can move to 3D. Yeah, yeah. So everyone has this uh, artist mm -hmm. in them. Just the medium keeps changing. Yeah. So <clears throat> the background that you come from actually plays a very huge role uh, in something that you do uh, in, in, you know, let's, to be safe, let's, for the sake of it, let's just say 3D art. So in 3D art, the background that you come from actually is very important because you might come with a different mindset. You might come in as an artist. You might come in as a commercial person who needs to get the job done, the requirements done. So the, the level of artistic uh, <clears throat> exploration is limited in that case, but you are getting things done. So that is completely up to you. But uh, you can also be a sculptor and you are just, uh, you know, trying to find a lot of different mediums to express yourself. So that actually is very important. And uh, if you are not just doing one thing, it is the best case scenario that because mm -hmm. uh, you are not limited at that point. You can yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I like, I see this also very well, for example, for me, um, like, in my free time before I did 3d, I did a lot of like photography and filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So I already yeah. Yeah. like knew about composition and about, yeah. um, like how to make a shot cinematic and all these kind of things. And where maybe someone else, as you said, maybe comes from coding or for a more mathematical profession or whatever. And yeah. he's like the absolute geometry notes pro and like yeah. really technical. And that's also so interesting to see like everyone uses like the same tool 
or that everyone has like a, a different approach. Exactly. Um, do it differently. And yes, I think it would be really cool to see a little bit more of your approach. And yeah, yeah by sharing your screen, you can show us a little bit behind the scenes. Yeah. And yeah, how you, yeah, how it actually looks in Blender. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do that. Okay, so uh, I'll be showing this video that I recently posted on my Instagram. Uh, this is basically made in Blender EV. Um, and uh, some of these things I've made, some of these things are basically kit bash. And uh, a lot of it uh, focuses on composition, lighting, and also finding a good view from the camera. Uh, so how it looks as a camera. So this is the video so it basically zooms in and there are a lot of elements floating by so nice and just one element focused in between mm. yeah nice. yeah so the video basically let me just walk through the composition here uh, mm -hmm. it is a simple one point perspective not that complicated one point or two point perspective uh, it is uh, it is like a drone shot so you know, you don't really have to worry about the eye levels and stuff, but uh, the composition here looks very, very heavy and very, you know, chaotic. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you see, the main focusing element is in the middle, which is this uh, sci-fi dystopian sort of a windmill, something that is basically powering the city or anything. And these are the <clears throat> uh, huge structures uh, that might be there. So the idea, the whole idea was, you know, about dystopia, about uh, future chaos and all of those things. I'm really inspired by um, Blade Runner and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of other sci-fi visuals. Also, Ian Hubert's, uh, uh, the, the short film series, the web series that he's doing. All of those, uh, that, that visual really fascinates me. So, you know, I tend to make things like this. Uh, for this one, I'm using assets uh, from Kitbash, from Rui Huang, from Max He, uh, who is a great artist uh, and a mm -hmm. great uh, educator about Blender and, you know, such uh, visuals. He has a really good, uh, you know, course coming out and uh, I've learned a lot from him. Um, then some of these elements are downloaded from Sketchfab. Some of these are just cubes and cuboids made in Blender. So let me just uh, walk you through the entire composition. Mm -hmm. So the camera is zooming in <clears throat> and the main element is in the middle, but the other elements are placed in such a way that everything leads towards mm -hmm. this one mm -hmm. focus. So these things are there, they are the details, but you don't really have to worry about the small, you know, fractions happening here and there. You don't really have to worry about the details on the buildings. It is supposed to be there placed, uh, you know, vertically and the line of sight would be this much when someone sees it mm -hmm. on the phone or any screen, this would be the focal point And these will be the, you know, supporting elements that are around it. So that is uh, one of the best uh, way of, you know, making something look very complicated, but at the same time, not get very confused with the scene itself while working on it. Uh, yeah, so this is how the scene looks in Blender. <laughs> it's uh, a bit too much. And this is basically my, you know, screen while I'm working. So there is a big, uh, you know, render view on the right. Mm -hmm. You have uh, the this uh, outliner and then you have the properties. But, you know, the most used panel is this one where, you know, I have the shading panel here, then I might mm -hmm. have UV unwrapping or I might switch it to, you know, geometry nodes uh, and something like that. Because I use mm -hmm. very uh, little uh, geometry nodes. I'm not that good at it. I just watch a tutorial and try to do that if I require something. Yes. Yeah. Same. Uh, yeah. <laughs> same thing. Same thing. Because I'm not that good with uh, numbers when it comes to coding and stuff, and when it comes to, you know, working with geometry nodes. But yeah, I just know basic scattering and some very little, you know, stuff related to some sort of modeling and stuff. Uh, then there is the graph editor. 
I usually have the asset browser here, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for this one, I was just using uh, some old program files that I already had, the project files, and just using those. So <clears throat> let me just break down the elements quickly. So the camera is placed here like mm -hmm. this, and it basically just zooms in in one direction. And also, yeah, I'm using EV so I can show this in real time cycles. It would mm. take like a week yeah, that, to that's process so this. crazy. <laughs> yeah. Cycle like crash your PC cycles would kill my <laughs> PC right now because I'm using yeah. a lot of volumetrics. So the cubes that you see mm. right now, they are all volumes and everything is, uh, you know, somehow a volume or, you know, creating mm. a mist or might be creating some sort of uh, an ambient light around the scene. The background is uh, just an HDRI. Let me just, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is how it looks in the render view. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. it's an HDRI. You might mm -hmm. not really uh, need the HDRI because I ended up using a very thick volumetric, but yeah, it's just a lot of planes, surfaces, cubes and cuboids. Mm -hmm. That's it nothing much the main game is in the shading and the and the texture oh that's a that's a nice view <laughs> just found the next post <laughs> new re new, new real unlocked new real unlocked <laughs> yeah 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 so <clears throat> okay so back to the point um if you see i have a very dense uh, cube formation cube and cuboid formation which are not really buildings, which are not that detailed. These are just mm -hmm. basic models. And uh, for this, you can use uh, this add-on uh, called uh, OSM, which oh, is yeah, yeah. OpenStreetMap. I saw this tutorial mm -hmm. by Max Hay, and you can basically take a snapshot of any region in any city, mm -hmm. any first tier one city, and you can basically get the 3D model of it. So it's really good and it's really low poly. So you don't really have to worry mm -hmm. about the polygon yeah. count and stuff. So this was the main parent model that I have, just a little fraction. And uh, nice. I, yeah. yeah, so I just created a plane, a surface in this wow. shape and then used geometry nodes, very simple mm -hmm. instance on points, you know, distributing yeah. points on faces so that it's more organic. And it also depends if you want to create it uh, like a grid uh, in the random value, you can just, uh, you know, have it zero and it can be uh, a simple grid. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you can you can make it as chaotic as possible. You can animate it or whatever you want mm -hmm. to do. So for this one, I scattered them a lot. Mm -hmm. The scene was uh, quite heavy, so it took Sometime because, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the geometry nodes, once you use it as instance, it basically takes a lot of RAM on your PC. So mm -hmm. it, it spends a lot of time, you know, processing it. And then after that, you know, just as highlighting elements, I have these buildings from the Neo Tokyo kit, probably from kit bash. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I am not really, uh, using a lot of textures here. These are just, that is just one texture which is on everything because I really like oh. the metallic glow that's happening on the buildings mm -hmm. and also on the highlight buildings. So element wise, if you pay attention, uh, there are filler buildings in between, which are mm -hmm. the scattered geometry nodes, uh, cubes and cuboids. And mm -hmm. then there are these uh, main elements which are like protruding out from the scene, which basically adds more detail and adds more stuff to your scene. Uh, this particular model was uh, downloaded or bought from uh, Rui Huang. You can model mm. it with a lot of nice. modifiers. Yeah, you, it is uh, hard surface modeling. You can watch mm. a lot of tutorials on that. I think uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, guys like Polyfjord and mm. a lot of uh, hard surface kit bashing guys are really into, you know, modeling stuff. So you can just, you know, quickly make something like this, or you can get some assets because that is totally fine. And, uh, yeah, this is something that I got from Sketchfab. It's a very cool looking, uh, crane. And I also like to add some more human touch to these things because, uh, you know, uh, if you see, uh, in any cities, 
you start noticing a lot of stuff there are city is not just buildings city is actually people and the life that's happening in the city and the buildings and everything acts as a backdrop so it adds to the story of the entire thing that you have made you know so uh, everything that you see now is basically a culmination of all of these uh, little things that you have uh, combined in these also talking about the main uh, windmill sort of uh, you know uh, object here mm -hmm. let me just uh, pull a quick yeah so this is where i kit bashed everything just a second oh okay go <laughs> back <laughs> uh, i have a lot of things open right now so okay so <clears throat> this is basically kit bashing uh, playbook you know uh, you take a lot of things from a lot of places and just mm. start combining everything until you are happy with the composition so this is a building that i got from the outpost uh, kit mm, of kit bash yeah. 3 i really like the the topography and the shape and the overall form mm. of the building and these little details that are there in the buildings also this is one of the building then if you can see max hay just uh, like quite a while ago he released a sci-fi course uh, and in the sci-fi kit uh, i got this uh, particular model which look like a really good you know uh, boiler sort of uh, an object so using that as a base i just started making stuff on top of it mm -hmm. so as a model it starts looking really fascinating once you have such little things you know placed on top of each other and when you start uh, when you see it textured let me just uh, load it up quickly this one was cycles <laughs> this is uh, the next oh, cycle okay. that is the basic thing that i do, use for texturing but uh, i prefer ev for such scenes yeah this has some maps taken from uh, you know this is there, there was this uh, little software called js placement which created a lot of uh, mm -hmm. little displacement maps and you can basically use that as your alpha map Mm -hmm. and uh, i just placed it as the opaque layer the, the uh, with the transparency on top of it so the these are two different rings mm -hmm. like this one ah uh, okay yeah like this and Interesting, there yeah. was uh, this one on top of it so it adds a bit more detail to the topography of the model so you don't really have to worry about it you can just animate it like this just rotating and uh, um, yeah yeah it will you know add more uh, details to your model also the texture here looks uh, you know the texture setup looks quite uh, you know messy but mm -hmm. it's just some roughness texture and uh, displacement with a lot of js placement uh, images okay. yeah. so you just have to play with the color ramp and uh, you know find what's best for your model at the time Mm. so you know kit bashing you are using such details such intricate models with just one texture and just one source of light it adds so much detail to whatever you are making so that's uh, one of the things that i really like about this particular you know uh, workflow mm -hmm. yeah let's just get back to this one now uh, so if yeah, you see yeah, yeah this is also done with the same method the form itself was done in blender nothing was kit bashed as such um for this one actually um yeah let's just go back okay so if you see the topography and everything is very simple it's just proportional editing and just uh, stretching things mm -hmm. around yeah. mm -hmm. until you are happy and this is from the i think from one kit from kit bash this particular element i didn't really uh, want to model yeah. all the details so <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've bought a lot of things and yeah this is just a simple plate with wireframe modifier okay so nice. <clears throat> pretty pretty simple job again max hay assets some max hay stuff uh, some mm -hmm. things model in blender this is again uh, this was geometry nodes and i think i am using this plugin by orin cloud which is secret paint 
it's a really good uh, plugin where you can basically paint with your uh, assets. You can use your asset as uh, something which can be added through the curve. And also there are a lot of uh, different controls. You can scale randomly. You can rotate a particular element in any direction. You know, let's say something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, you know, depends on what you are looking for any shape or form or anything. Yeah, it has, uh, it has really interesting details. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's really good uh, that you can, you know, just uh, use it. And if you see, if I, pre if I go to the edit mode, it's just one curve. And mm, everything yeah. is an instance on top of it. So you can basically use the curve to play around uh, with the shape and, yeah. you know, with the form of the entire thing. Nice. Yeah, so it's uh, really good. I'm using a lot of assets and a lot of uh, plugins for this. And mm. uh, because that makes the workflow very fast and you don't really mm. have to do a lot uh, in the geometry nodes after that. So yeah, yeah whatever, whatever floats your boat actually. And uh, yeah, this was the overall form and I was quite happy with it. So, you know, I just started playing with the proportions and the proportions, once you have them in place, all you have to do is play with the volumetrics and also the light. The mm -hmm. light setup here is also very simple. I'm using two sun lamps, uh, this one and this one, which yeah. provides two lights. So yeah, yeah, not just one light source, you can use two. And uh, yeah, you can also play with the strength if you want uh, a directional light from somewhere or anything. Mm -hmm. but, That's interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, because uh, the sun lamp, because it, it basically emulates sun. So mm -hmm. the rays that you get are parallel to each other. And it is mm -hmm. not just one surface or just one point, but it is actually coming in yeah. as whole. So you can get really good interaction with your model. You can get really good interaction with your uh, lights and the volumetrics as well. So that's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. really, really interesting. And uh, you can, so what I basically do is just have one sun lamp and just to play with the rotation because it doesn't really work with the, the location. It works with the mm -hmm. rotation. So, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. if you are looking for something more dramatic, you can find a way to have uh, some sort of God rays in your scene like mm -hmm. this, like, uh, like that. But if you just have one scene, you won't be able to, uh, you know, highlight the buildings here because it will be just one direction light and everything in mm -hmm. foreground would be dark. So for that, uh, I added yeah. another uh, light source. It's a very simple light setup. So if you change it around, you can still have the background, uh, but you can yeah. also uh, start, you know, focusing more yeah. on the foreground and the, the lights which are there. <clears throat> yeah, it's, so it's cool. basically completely playing with the properties and the, you know, geometry of light itself. So you are using light as a design element. You're not using light that basically fa uh, facilitates your scene. It's actually mm -hmm. an element that can be, you know, played with. So yeah, you can use both actually at once. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it gives you a really interesting uh, scenes, but in my case, I don't really like to, you know, highlight the front facing part of the scene, mm -hmm. which is the building. Having shadows in that part actually adds a lot of dramatic details to your model mm, yeah. and to your scene. That's so a good point. Yeah. It's, it's more uh, dark and more detailed. If you're doing a daylight scene, still this is very important because, uh, uh, you know, let's say you are doing something, the same scene in daylight would not work with the same light setup because I would mm. not have uh, two sources of light. I would have an HDRI yeah. <laughs> or a yeah. brighter sky and uh, the light would be there just to, you know, show it. But mm. the dark scenes work really well with uh, EV, with the glow and stuff. It adds to the, yeah. and also the sci-fi and dystopian stuff is usually very dark. It's the easiest mm. option in my opinion. It's the easiest yeah. thing true, that you can true. do. Yeah. If I wanted to do this uh, daylight, I would not post it at all because it looked so horrible. <laughs> It, it looks so basic and so horrible and all the details were lost because yeah. once you have <clears throat> such a light setup and then such a metallic texture, it starts bringing out all the little details with the displacement that you added uh, in, the, yeah. in the node yeah. editor. 
Yeah. And then the next most important thing is the volumetrics because mm -hmm. without volumetrics, this would be just a random, uh, you know, mesh of models. Because if I yeah, take away yeah. the modifier, it yeah. is a composition, but it yeah. looks horrible because the uh, difference is crazy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The difference is insane because uh, now let me add everything. So it adds a lot of detail <clears throat> with the volumetrics and yeah, that, also like, yeah, also yeah, a lot of yeah. depth. You really feel like exactly. the scale of the scene. Yeah, exactly. You really feel the environment. You really feel the depth. You feel the pollution. You feel the human mm -hmm. and the real life earth like features because mm -hmm. you don't really see a very clear uh, world in front of you. Things are mm -hmm. very imperfect. So the best way to uh, have hyper realism and realism in your scene and perfection in your scene is to pursue or, you know, run after imperfection. Yeah. More rugged and more bad looking the stuff is, the more uh, close to reality it will look. Because there are no huge windmills in the middle of the city, but you can still create this imagination through yeah. emulating the background, you know, make it look like, uh, you know, New York in next 200 years or maybe some uh, like India, India in 500 years, you know, mm -hmm. what if things went wrong and you know, everything started getting polluted, you'll yeah. start seeing things like this because we are hardwired to understand reality and pursue reality in such a way. We start so even if something from imagination, which is totally fiction, it has to have some sort of relation with the reality as well. So that gives you the mm -hmm. best uh, sort of output and yeah the volumetrics is pretty uh it's a it's a very trial and error sort of a process you know you can have some volume there you cannot have some volume there uh but uh, yeah let me just show you three kinds of volumes that i have mm -hmm. i have basically okay so one sort of uh, situation that i have here is just the fog which is uh, a solid cuboid Mm -hmm. um, like this one, which doesn't really have any clouds or any details to it. It, it is just, it just has density, which is mm -hmm. very less, to be honest, you don't really have to keep it too high because the scene will start yeah, getting yeah. very dark, yeah. uh, but the density is there. And then you have to play around with this uh, property called anisotropy. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a really good property that you can experiment with if you increase it. Uh, the particles closer to the light source will start glowing. And if you decrease it, the entire scene will start glowing. So right now it's 0. 0.5, right? Um, mm -hmm. If I increase it, it uh, will yeah. start glowing yeah. closer to the light source. And if I mm -hmm. decrease it, it will start getting more dull and more dim. Yeah. So yeah. I think around 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, that are, uh, those are the numbers that I usually use so that you get mm -hmm. the right tint and right temperature out of the scene. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that is one type of uh, volume that mm -hmm. I use. The another one is something that you see in the bottom here, uh, which yeah, is yeah. these sort of lights, uh, which is emitting. And at that point, uh, you are just using a lot of things. <laughs> I learned this from Rui Huang. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I saw his note set up and just started combining stuff here and there. So it's like mm -hmm. uh, understanding everything from there. You're just using uh, two uh, points here, which is the emission color and emission mm -hmm. strength. Don't really have to worry about the other uh, stuff. Yeah. Just increase the temperature a little bit. But uh, emission strength is a very, um, you know, normal thing. It's not that complicated, but the emission color or yeah, basically the color and the volume itself is created <clears throat> through this, uh, insane node setup where I'm, uh, <laughs> how do I, how do I ex explain this? I'm not sure. <laughs> Wait, let me just, oh no, not like that. Um, yeah, just a second. Yeah. By the way, in the meantime, what, what kind of yeah. PC do you have? Like just quickly, what kind of graphics card and RAM? Uh, yeah, I have uh, uh, a Ryzen 9, mm -hmm. um, uh, 64, uh, 32 GB RAM and then 64 GB RAM. Total, it is 64 GB RAM. 
mm-hmm. and uh, the graphic card is uh, 4090 RTX. Okay. Uh, nice. I have two computers actually. Uh, this one is mm-hmm. 4090. The other one is uh, 3090. I use that okay. for nice. uh, some other rendering stuff if I'm using this nice. right now. Yeah. So I use them both with the LAN connection and just, you know, use everything locally. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, yeah, continue. let's continue. So if you see, there are these small lights coming out of it mm-hmm. like that. Um, it's again, it's just a cuboid, but you are playing a lot with the texture setup here. Um, Highlight some stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I'll I'll need a long time to explain the node setup here. So if uh, we can skip this, I'm fine with that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to explain it like step by step. But yeah. basically, like as I understand it, it just yeah. creates like detail and gives yeah. it like some different colors with so, some color yeah. ramps and some textures. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then you have like it. It like simulates some buildings emitting light out of the yeah, ground, right? Exactly, exactly. So basically uh, light interacting with fog, but uh, you are using the alpha channel or the alpha property a lot here. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, any JS placement or any black and white image can be used as a back here. Mm-hmm. And the other things can be controlled with the color ramp uh, like this. And you just have to mm-hmm. map stuff around and then stretch things in the Z axis. So if the Z axis is stretched, you get this very beautiful uh, sort of uh, vertical uh, rays emitting mm-hmm. from the cube itself. So that is the another type of uh, you know a cube a volumetric uh, cuboid that I use. Nice. And the yeah. third one is the moving clouds. So uh, again, yeah. it is <clears throat> again it is adding a lot of details to the scene. So if you see, there is a lot mm-hmm. of moving volume here yeah like this so even in the video if you see uh, this will be more clearer Mm -hmm. if i play this you see a lot of uh, little dirt flying around yeah like that so uh, again the node setup is very simple for that as well um you are playing with the density here using the noise texture so noise texture is basically you know uh, subtracting some part mm-hmm. from uh, your entire volume, which is a plain cube <clears throat> and taking it away, which creates this very beautiful cloud sort of detail, which is very, very, um, you know, organic looking. And uh, you can just play with the uh, color ramp there and, you know, make sure it is not too much or too little. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to find a very simple, sweet spot there. Mm-hmm. And then you can just uh, animate it in any one direction in a very okay, slow, cool. yeah. slow pattern. So, you know, uh, if it is, uh, you know, animated in the X direction, it will move horizontally like that because the mm-hmm. scene is oriented that way. So you can just move it around like this and find a very simple, very, nice. very yeah. slow. You just have to try a lot with the speed of the form because you mm-hmm. don't really want to make it look like a sandstorm or a thunderstorm <laughs> because it will be yeah. a little too much you know the the uh, the focus from the details would be gone after mm-hmm. that yeah. but so, if it's too slow it also looks weird right yeah exactly yeah. if it is too slow it looks very robotic and uh, forced you know so you don't really want to go there as well yeah and then there are these uh, little lights coming from yeah. the below really cool. of the city yeah actually it is just a simple lava sort of texture <laughs> I think I posted nice. the tutorial on my stories, but let me just quickly explain this. Okay. So I have this scene. Uh, so I use the half of the model from this project file. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. And, uh, so here it is more evident and more visible how this uh, light is working. Actually, these are very small details, a little, uh, you know, organic dot grid that emulates mm-hmm. the city light. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is basically, you know, adding more depth and more detail uh, to the city itself. And here I'm also using the same, you know, city model that I showed you earlier, just scanning yeah, it around, yeah. making it more organic and have the highlighting buildings around. So yeah, that is basically a very simple node setup. In the alpha channel, 
you just have to have a simple node texture and make sure you have distortion, a lot of distortion. Mm, so it gives yeah. you these waves. If the distortion is less, it will be very simple, like little patches. Oh yeah. But yeah. if you have more distortion, it will be more organic. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe increase the thickness more you know, detailed and rugged. The detail has to be maximum. Uh, you can play with the scale. You can make it smaller. Don't make it too large. But the image that I'm using here is just a simple dot grid taken from JS placement. It oh yes, yeah, yeah. Something uh, like this. It's any. Yeah. It's like any other dot grid, and the black mm. part would be gone in the alpha channel, and you can use yes. it yeah. with any colored overlay. So you can make it blue, mm. purple, pink, red, whatever. Yeah. You know, nice. red would look nice. It looks so nice and, and easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so much faster. You know, you can do yeah. everything at once. Um, yeah, let's just go back very quickly. And you know, it's just one plane. You don't really have to worry about uh, the details. Uh, you know, because nobody is going to pay attention to it. It is just yeah. a supporting yeah. element in the composition itself, mm -hmm. uh, which is just adding to the whole depth and. Uh, beauty of the scene so yeah that ends up looking really nice and my computer is stuck now <laughs> let's just wait for <laughs> two minutes more <laughs> ah you're back perfect okay so yeah. that is how the whole whole thing functions and i'm not that good at animating very little things like you uh, I, I really mess up animation after a while so i try to keep the animation or the moving part as minimal mm -hmm. as possible. So if you see, there are just some elements moving around. One is the camera, mm -hmm. uh, which is the most important thing where you actually show the depth of the scene. And mm -hmm. then you have these moving ships, like flying cars, which are just, you know, there and just time coded. Um, yeah, like just with two keyframes. Yeah, just two keyframes from one point to the other, and it just stops. And yeah. the other ones start appearing. So you don't, you don't really see it anyways. <laughs> yeah, you don't see it anyways. The camera matters more. Uh, there are these little ships, which is just a simple particle system of a very basic mm. set of uh, ships for nice. yeah. any objects. And it's just moving in any one direction. So it looks like mm. air traffic. And it has to look like two way traffic, which is more chaotic, you know, it adds to the yeah, yeah. depth. You don't really have to worry about the realistic scale. You just should make sure uh, that it looks, you know, perceivable, not too big or too little because yeah, yeah. there are no cranes that are going to be this big. Physically, it's not possible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like true, it's, it's true. I didn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 actually. But this is basically forced perspective. So the the focal length of the camera also plays a huge role. Right now oh, I'm yeah. using it. I wanted 50. to ask about that. Yeah, right now it is fifty. So such huge scenes, I tend to keep it more flat, which is a very higher focal length. So you know, mm -hmm. fifty, let's say sixty or maybe hundred, it makes the scene look flat, but also mm -hmm. uh, it uh, highlights the scale a lot. But if I make it like you know thirty, thirty five. It will look like a very wide angle scene. If you're going for it, that is fine, but it will start, you know, revealing some details that you don't really want to re reveal. Yeah. Yeah. For and uh, <clears throat> for such fisheye sort of perspective, it is very good because if you are doing a very, very large scene, uh, less focal length actually is very nice. But for uh, such a scene, actually, I found 50 to be the perfect, mm. uh, you know, because yeah. it is cropping at the right uh, amount. You don't really have to move the camera much because with 30 mm. or something, even a slight rotation actually changes the entire scene yeah. completely yeah. <laughs> because it is very sensitive. But as uh, higher the focal length is, the more flat is going to look and the proportions are going to be, you know, highlighted. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can do anything. There are no thumb rules for this particular thing. Um, and yeah, there is just a very simple hologram here of uh, a female figure that I just found. I think this is from uh, the Future Monkey. I forgot the name of the artist, but it's a uh, free kit that you can download online. And I downloaded it oh, okay. in 
2022 i think it's a very old kit and one of the first free kits that i downloaded mm-hmm. so <clears throat> there are like hundreds and hundreds of small bottles that you can use it's just rotating on z axis and moving uh, up and down on z axis and uh, just make sure you have um, you know this uh, bezier curve interpolation on because if it is oh, linear yeah. it will start looking very yeah <laughs> Yeah, very like funny. Very robotical. Like, tack, 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 <laughs> yeah. like that. So yeah, make sure you you consciously animate stuff, but uh, mm-hmm. it has to be very minimal in my case. Personally, yeah. I feel that is much better. And but yeah, it's way enough. Like even just a yeah. small, I think one crane moves a little bit. Yeah, like both, both even just cranes move just yeah, a little like, bit. Yeah, but small things like that. Yeah, uh, that like, adds... adds so much to the final product. Yeah, exactly because. You cannot really uh, move stuff at a very fast pace uh, yeah, in such yeah. a scene because it starts looking unreal. You know, mm-hmm. the the speed and the motion is one of the very crucial things that we have to pay attention to. Another thing that I found, um, you know, very helpful while trying stuff out is the placement of the volume because if you see, the camera is not actually inside the volume. Mm-hmm. It is actually outside the volume cube. Uh, let me just highlight it. Oh yeah. So yeah. this is the volume, and the camera is outside it. True. So it is. Act- so the camera is not part of the environment. It is actually zoomed out so that the mm-hmm. volume acts as a layer and not an entire environment. Because if I move the volume around too much or maybe scale it too much, the detail that you see on the foreground here. Will be lost completely. Yeah, and it will be a bit be, yeah. hazy. Yeah. yeah. So the the volumes have to be placed like that so that your foreground is more detailed, and mm-hmm. the background is more uh, you know uh, more dull or more has more depth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that is about it. That is the whole breakdown of the entire scene. These are a lot nice. of little <laughs> elements, a lot of instances, a lot of things moving around. But yeah, this is how it looks when I'm, you know, working around, you know, just moving stuff around yeah. and just yeah. rotating stuff around and, you know, until, so cool until to see it in happy. real time. <laughs> yeah, man. Evie, thanks to Evie. Yeah. <laughs> if it was cycles, yeah. we would be recording this podcast for yeah. like a week. <laughs> yeah. No, this, this was really informative. I think maybe yeah. the last thing, maybe you could show that would be interesting f- for me, especially because you use um, Evie. Is maybe yeah. like your export and <clears throat> render settings, or yeah. maybe some important things you have to like enable, yeah. um, so EV works properly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in EV, you have to manually uh, turn all the things on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it is a default setting, uh, which is not. With, uh, I think you know it is subjective because a lot of uh, product designers use it for a very small scale and you don't really need to mm-hmm. use all the features here but mm-hmm. uh, the important things that you should be doing are you know at first just turn everything on ambient occlusion mm-hmm. is very important uh, the bloom is one of the most important things and yeah. these settings there are no important or you know, you know there are no thumb rules you can just play around with the bloom yeah. in this case um don't change the color. You can play with the intensity and, uh, you know, just the threshold because threshold is basically the limit which allows uh, the particles to glow. So mm-hmm. if the threshold is more, the glow is going to be less. The threshold is less. It is going to glow more. Yeah. Yeah. So like depending on how bright the asset exactly, is or the material exactly, is. Yeah. How the material is. Exactly. Also, uh, screen space uh, re- uh, reflections you can also turn on refractions if the scene requires it i would mm-hmm. suggest turn it on uh, these are very detailed very small things that you cannot really explain or you cannot really understand by someone saying uh, mm-hmm. but you can just you know try to play around it but yeah, evie yeah. i found it uh, really crucial to have a really good lighting setup because mm-hmm. see these things are, Almost all of those things I use on the default settings. I just play with the volumetrics, with the start mm. and end, and maybe increase the samples a little bit, because that is very important. Oh, yeah. You should also turn on volumetric lighting, and in some cases, volumetric shadows as well. But depends. Okay. If you increase yeah. the shadows, 
uh, the background might be dull because the surface uh, itself is going yeah, to cast shadows. Yeah. But if you turn it off, uh, it is not going to be uh, that dark. Mm-hmm. Uh, in cycles, everything yeah. is by default and everything is quite mm-hmm. realistic. Yeah. So you don't really have to worry about these little details. But um, like we need to be very conscious with these uh, properties. But mm-hmm. you know, let's not spend so much time on it. And actually, the most important thing is in EV, especially having a good setup of lighting and a mm-hmm. very uh, good displacement in the materials. So the roughness, uh, you know, little bump and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So if I have all these settings in place, like even in the default settings, I'm not that uh, complicating it. The lighting is not right. uh, The scene is going to uh, look bad because Mm -hmm. the lighting plays one of the best roles. If I have some light like this, it is never going to be good because the HDRI is showing, the background is there, but you have to be... Mm -hmm. Uh, one light, at least one light source in such a way that uh, it basically uh, starts uh, giving emission to the volume itself. So the synergy between the volume and the light is very important. So the Mm -hmm. orientation of the light and the placement of the volume. That is one of the most important things for this that I have found. But yeah, you can go as deep as you want. Uh, Even the placement of camera is very important because if you place mm-hmm. it like this, you get really good glare here. <clears throat> and again, you can have another uh, source of light anywhere. But yeah. with EV, yeah. there is this limitation that uh, you cannot really use indirect lighting. So you have to use mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, default <laughs> light sources. You cannot really mm-hmm. uh, give emission to one plane yeah. and use it as a light source that we usually do in mm-hmm. cycles. So yeah, ideally, you know, some sun lamps and also spotlights on very Mm -hmm. high emission or heavy, very heavy power would be one of the best things that you can do in Mm -hmm. your scenes. Because I always uh, step back from using spotlights, but actually spotlights are very good. And I learned it from Max A, Mm -hmm. huge shout out. Uh, I learned it from his course. Uh, because uh, I always hated spotlights because it's just one point source which is coming like yeah. this. <laughs> but uh, you can just push it way away in the scene mm-hmm. and just increase the power a lot and mm-hmm. you know increase the blending of that light yeah, so that yeah. it looks more one directional. In a lot of my other scenes, uh, so if you see this one, the the white glow here yeah, is yeah. actually a spotlight. Uh, ah. You cannot get that with sun because yeah. it has parallel rays. But yeah. uh, with spotlight, yeah. you can actually get this sort of beautiful directional lights mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, so these are properties that you can always explore. I just learned that you can actually change the uh, the spread of the area light like two days ago. I've been using Blender for four years and I just yeah. found it out. <laughs> but it's always <laughs> like that. Like. Always like Even that. after 10 years, probably you're going to discover new things. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that is the whole point, actually, because uh, mm-hmm. nobody is going to understand everything. You can, yeah, you know, always definitely. learn different things. I'm still learning emission uh, properties. Mm-hmm. I'm still learning mm-hmm. animation stuff. Uh, I'm not that good with simulation, but I'm learning that as well. Yeah, so it's it's looking good. And that's about the workflow, actually. And everything, actually, if you have a scene in mind, it's much faster and much easier to play with it and, you know, experiment with it and uh, much easier to come up with a composition that actually looks really mm-hmm. nice. But, uh, you know, if you are just trying uh, stuff out, you just have to wait and just, you know, keep trying a uh, different composition, mm-hmm. you know, playing with toys, you know, uh, something plays here, some light here. If it's not looking good, you can just scrap mm-hmm. out the entire scene. There have been so many times where I've deleted the project files because I'm so annoyed with the things that I've made. It's not looking good, (laughs) no matter how much I try. Because I Mm -hmm. don't really want to spend so much time, you know, polishing the turd, as they say. Yeah, fair enough. (laughs) You better start like from scratch. You better uh, start from scratch. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, that's about it. That's the whole uh, workflow and basically the workflow that I use for almost all the sci-fi cityscapes that I make uh, these days. 
and uh, yeah nice. almost all of them the animation is very simple the scene setup mm -hmm. subjectively it's very simple but it looks quite chaotic because the elements are so dense but yeah. it's yeah. low poly it's not that uh, high mm -hmm. poly count and yeah. on the like the low poly cubes you just have some displacement <clears throat> textures right yeah or like the some same normal... texture the yeah. same texture on yeah, everything yeah the same okay it's, it's the nice. same yeah. texture on everything so cool. yeah uh, because nobody is going to you know pay attention on the details yeah. of totally. the yeah. window detail and stuff so yeah you can do it but if you are doing some sort of cinematic uh, thing where the entire model is going to be exposed to the camera you might like to add more details to the buildings which are in the foreground at least but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah preferably i would just use this because it looks like a game it looks like a concept art actually you don't really have to worry about mm -hmm. the world building part of it yeah <laughs> i found more question and it's about the color you use yeah so i think you use really like cool color that also match together like yeah. for example this one is like green and then you have a little bit of orange which yeah like i would have never yeah thought about this but it looks so cool so yeah like how do you approach this yeah. kind of thing actually you just try it uh, out like try and error or you have uh, like some kind of it is kind color of color guide uh, or... trial and error, but uh, <laughs> i've i've also taught uh, graphic designing and graphics mm -hmm. for quite a while yeah. and i've researched a lot about color theory and the feelings that you get from the colors and mm. the basic principles mm. of color theory where you know you can use monochromatic color scheme or you can use complementary colors which are on the opposite mm. side of the spectrum which are always going to look good and yeah. uh, also understanding and having a very good visual library with a lot of references where you know sci-fi scenes are more cool background with warm highlights or warm mm -hmm. backgrounds with cool highlights so if it is a scene like uh, you know let's say dune or something uh, the background is going to be orange but mm -hmm. the foreground or the lights very little lights can be blue so orange and yeah, blue yeah. Uh, very dark deep red and blue are always going to look nice uh, even with green green and orange green and red are a very uncanny uh, combination mm -hmm. Yeah. not <clears throat> that used but i learned it from some portrait artists who mm -hmm. use oil painting so i saw nice. this yeah. uh, scene which was i think it was an oil painting i can't remember it but if you see a lot of renaissance paintings and a lot of mm -hmm. uh, classical uh, paintings by the great artists if there is a dark uh, you know emotional scene and there is sort of a candle light in front of the character there is a very beautiful orange hue painted all over the body or all, all over the skin mm, and that yeah. combination of dark tones and very vivid bright colors always fascinates me and also if you are finding uh, if anyone is finding it tough to have uh, you know understanding of colors there is this mm -hmm. uh, very beautiful website called um arobi colors yeah uh and in there there is basically you know a beautiful color wheel or you know you can download color schemes from there it nice, is completely yeah. free and you can just you know copy the hex codes from there mm -hmm. but if you open the color um, color wheel let's say create yeah <clears throat> so um just a second yeah something like this so Perfect. Uh, let's say if you want a monochromatic color scheme, you can just select monochromatic here. And if you want to play with the shades mm, of blue, yeah, you can just yeah. select any blue and it will give you like five to six different nice. options of nice. blue. And you can just copy this code and paste it mm. in your color wheel in Blender. Yeah, yeah. So it will give you that color. Uh, the best thing, the best colors in my opinion are complementary colors. Mm. So as I said, uh, yellow and blue. And of course, orange and green, red and yeah, green. Yeah. So yeah, red and green with, you know, some sort of peach, orange color, you know, purple and yellow. You see a lot of uh, sci-fi games, like cyberpunk uses a lot of yeah, uh, yeah. color schemes. True, true. Yeah. yeah, so that game basically changed, uh, or basically gave you a, a pretty simple guide to how to, you know, make cyberpunk mm. scenes. And I also uh, like uh, the work of this artist called Baka Arts. He's a German artist. 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, he does, uh, you know, Mobius sort of uh, artworks. It looks you... like a cartoon a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's it's yeah. a it's a great uh, art style. Um, I forgot the name of the genre, but uh, the art style is called something. Uh, let me just uh, find it out later. But uh, that art style basically, he uses really good warm colors with the combination mm -hmm. of depth in the scene. It also has yeah. the line work. So you know. Uh, oh my God. Can I open it like that? Is that fine? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Scenes like this, or maybe this, you know, something like this is very inspirational for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of his new artworks, I really like uh, the work that he's been doing uh, quite recently as well. And if you see, there is a very good uh, combination between the hues, different colors, yeah, yeah. and also the depth created with the uh, shadows in the color. It is a flat mm -hmm. uh, shaded scene, but uh, if you actually pay attention from a distance, it gives you the idea of depth, the idea of, uh, you know, subtle details that you can do uh, in the in your scene, very, very detailed models. And mm -hmm. this might look, you know, very uh, simple or, you know, like a cartoon sort of a scene, but it's very, very, very hard to do. It's a very, very complicated process. So I find this very fascinating. And also mm -hmm. a lot of artists that I keep uh, seeing nowadays, uh, the community is growing. So <laughs> it's always uh, the learning process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think with that, if you don't have anything else, um, yeah, I think we can come to an end. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much for yeah being here. It was so interesting. Um, like I could learn so many new things and also get a lot of inspiration from you. And you have also many interesting takes. And so, yeah, thank you so much. Glad you like it, man. I, I really uh, would like to, you know, take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me to talk about these yeah, things. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, such discussions are very important as artists because mm -hmm. if you gain some knowledge, it is good to spread it with people so that more and yeah. more people yeah. can learn about it and, uh, you know, come up with a lot of new things that might inspire you at the end. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's really good learning from you, learning from a lot of people on YouTube, learning from Instagram, applying all of those learnings into making something mm -hmm. new that has always been really fascinating. So, yeah, thanks a lot for this. And I hope uh, everyone listening to this enjoys and learns some things. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. Make sure to check um, Nishad out. I put his Instagram link into the description. Um, so yeah, make sure to follow him. And with that, I wish you all a great week. And yes, hopefully see you soon. Thank you so much for watching until the end. And I hope you could learn something. Let me know in the comment if you have any more questions and also what guests you want to have next on Behind the Art. Also, you can join my Discord completely for free and get a cool community, get challenges every month and yeah, also get feedback on your stuff and grow together with the community. If you don't support this video, you can also join the exclusive section on my Discord while also getting guidance, personal feedback and exclusive tutorials. Thank you so much for watching and goodbye.